one of the probably more familiar texts during the Easter season is highlighted by various gospel accounts of what we call the triumphal entry. You can put that in quotes, many people do. Uh, that is, of course, Christ's entry into Jerusalem uh, on the Sunday before Easter as we in the West look at these things. Uh, Christianity often begins with what I've come to call the donkey event. Okay, it, uh, We'll look at that in a moment, but then proceeds to and often ends with the palm branch uh, entry uh, going up to the temple area. And it's truly a wondrous picture. Uh, it really is. It's a wondrous scene that shows Christ's formal entry into Jerusalem as he makes his proclamation and his offer to the nation of Israel as its Messiah. It's the promise of the Old Testament that is there. But I think sometimes we miss some things. Uh, we, I think that there is a richer vision that we can benefit from. Uh, I think we can include uh, some additional information that we get from Scripture itself and even harmonize maybe our Lord's earthly entry into Jerusalem with a heavenly perspective uh, that uh, provides some truths uh, that Jesus was originally trying to get across in its context to the Jewish nation, uh, but of course with the ongoing, uh, what's that, ripple effect of impacting all of the world as well. Now, a bit of history to kind of establish a, a, a way of, of thought to allow us to glean better from uh, the New Testament text we're going to, but if you understand a little bit about the era of Moses, okay, uh, following the death of Moses, God brought Joshua into the role of national leadership. You remember that, okay, it, uh, from your Old Testament lessons. But stop and consider for a moment the, some of the stellar, what should I say, uh, personal appearances of man uh, in the scripture itself. I think most of us, outside of our Lord himself, obviously, especially in the gospel accounts, uh, would clearly understand that uh, in all probability the Apostle Paul just leaps off the pages of Scripture. The, the writer of many books of the New Testament in the epistle area, uh, the primary theologian and doctrinal teacher and emphasizer, uh, that is there and everything that goes with that. Uh, in a kind of a parallel perspective, the Old Testament, well, you could come up with, uh, a, you know, a, for instance, a Joseph or even Father Abraham to a degree. Uh, Moses, if is at least a, and in some cases could certainly be considered the stellar figure, humanly speaking, of the Old Testament. He was the human author, for instance, of the Torah, the, the five books, the first five books of the Old Testament. God used him there. He was a worker of miracles in Egypt, uh, including, the, of course, the parting of the Red Sea and everything that went with it. He was the spokesman to and for God himself, resulting from his time in the cloud of God's Shekinah glory you know, on the top of Mount Sinai. It, uh, the uh, God's human vessel for carrying the tablets of stone that we call the Ten Commandments back down to the nation of Israel. In addition, of course, he brought the entire Torah, uh, all of the Old Testament uh, commandments and prohibitions uh, that we see as the Mosaic law system, everything that went with it. He was a skilled statesman. He was a very skilled orator. And I'm sure that without a lot of undue effort, you could add at least another half dozen things to his profile, you know, if you spent any time considering it at all, okay? Now, let's talk about his replacement for a moment, okay? Uh, go, if you, you want to follow me, uh, go to the book of Joshua, uh, right after Deuteronomy, 
And you know, there's a reason for all of this before we get to you know, our Palm Sunday uh, considerations. Uh, it says, as the book of Joshua opens, that after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now rise and go over the Jordan, you and all the people, to the land that I will give you for the children of Israel. And he goes on and talks about you know, how he's going to cross the Euphrates, deal with the Hittites. No man can stand before him. Verse 6 says, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people you will divide the inheritance in the land that I swore to their fathers. Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commands you. And, it, and then you drop on down a little bit more. And then once again, he emphasizes in verse 9, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Verse 12, uh, he talks about the Reubenites, the Gadites, and so forth. Verse 13 says, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. And then in verse 15, at the end of the verse, he talks about in, in, in caught in possessing the land which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of Jordan with the sun rising. If you count them up, that's five times in this one chapter that Moses is referred to as God's servant. If you and I were writing the biography of Moses, we would be more likely, humanly speaking, to emphasize some of those tremendous accomplishments that I've already referred to. The statesman, the orator, the doer of miracles, the leader of a nation, the deliverer of a people. You know, it's uh, water out of rock, parting the Red Sea, and on it goes. God says to Joshua, I'm looking for a leader, and I want another one like Moses, and Moses was my servant. I'm not worried about you being a skilled orator. And Joshua went on to be a grand leader of the nation of Israel, very skilled in combat, a tactician, a leader of men, the leader of the nation, and everything that went with it. Fantastic guy. But when God was looking for a leader, he wanted a servant. And that's what he says five times in that chapter. Essentially, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. I'm looking for a replacement servant. You want the job? Because I'm looking for a servant. So I'll take care of what you produce. I'm looking for the heart of a servant. Now, I bring this little story up as we leave it here. It's a very simple illustration, really. Uh, because we often find ourselves viewing things, events of Scripture especially, and the, even the teachings of it, through the eyes of mankind, is mankind's reasoning, mankind's logic, you know, mankind's philosophical perspective, the influence of culture uh, that you know, just comes in and just beats us up at times. Uh, Christianity in 21st century Western United States is quite a bit different than Christianity was in the 13th century in Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not talking about core doctrines. That's not the point. The perceptions of what Christianity is to be is often dictated by our earthly circumstances, culture, and so forth. And the illustration of how God views his chosen servants is quite a bit different the way that you and I would write a biography for Moses. God says, I want a servant. Mm -hmm. Well, that is there. See? God doesn't necessarily evaluate men in the same way that we do. He's not looking for the consequences that you and I might prospect uh, or expect, I'm sorry. Uh, the decision-making process is different. We sit down and do the pros and cons and rationalize, or the other extreme, we go on a gut feeling. Uh, those, neither one of those are normally or often or even normally the best response. Okay? 
Uh, mankind's perspective is a little different. I'm going to suggest to you here are several things, and we're going to be using Matthew chapter 21 this morning. Not that you couldn't go to other gospel accounts and find this, but Matthew 21, uh, you will recognize the opening verses are all about the donkey event. Ready? Yeah, here we are. Here's the donkey. Here he comes. It, uh, now, I'm just going to high grade it. I'm going to speed through it as far as the reading because what I want us to get is the overall concepts that are here of what God is projecting more so than the details about where the donkey was tied and all the other stuff that goes with it. So follow me briefly as we look at, we're going to look at the whole chapter in the next few minutes. But, you know, again, on a concise basis as well. This is Palm Sunday. And when they drew nigh to Jerusalem, they came unto Bethphage and unto the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the village over against you, and immediately you will find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if any man asks you what in the world you're doing stealing these horses or donkey. You shall say, the Lord hath need of them, and he'll let you have them. Whoa. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Don't try that with my chainsaw. <laughs> okay? Yeah. It, that's not, yeah. You see how unusual that is. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, uh, this is Zechariah, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king cometh to you meek and sitting upon an ass, the, con the a colt, the foal of an ass, the disciples went, did as the Lord commanded them, brought the ass colt, put on their clothes, and set him on it. Okay? So that's just the core aspect of it. That's the donkey incident. Okay? Now I'm going to point out to you the number one thing that this part of Matthew 21 deals with. Prophetic fulfillment. Okay? The God who orchestrated and brought to pass the whole Palm Sunday scenario leading to the cross a week later is the God who is outside of time and has caused his servants centuries previously, in this case through Zechariah, to write down a prophecy that was so distinctive and unique that it could only be filled by an exact fulfillment of a supernatural God. And that's what you have here. You've got the donkey incident is actually a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Okay? And that is the God who is superintending all of this Palm Sunday scenario. Verse 8 and following says, A very great multitude spread their garments in the way. They cut down branches from the palm trees. It tells us in other, the other gospels. And it strawed them in the way, spread them out. Multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means deliver now. Okay, This is what they were, again, fulfilling scripture, prophetic scripture from the Old Testament because they were welcoming, they were identifying and welcoming the promised Messiah. Okay? This was the crowd as it appeared. When he came into Jerusalem, the entire city was in an uproar saying, what's going on? Who is this? And said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Okay? He was a fulfilled, they recognized him okay, for that role of, of fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Jesus, it says, is the next, it, you know, that's, that's where the Hosannas, these identification with prophetic fulfillment even though they did not understand the richness of it. Uh, God uses people even when they're about half conscious some of the time, especially you know, spiritually, uh, in order to actually understand what God is orchestrating, what he's bringing about here in its context, Palm Sunday. And there's a third aspect to this little passage here in the next few verses, and that's called the priority of worship. Jesus goes into the temple, okay, he just, he's ridden in, boom, adoration of the people, recognition of prophetic fulfillment, and now he winds up in the temple, uh, and he, that's, and they are selling and buying, 
Now, you don't get the nuances here directly from Matthew, but these are guys that are using the opportunity of the celebration of what you and I call Easter. They didn't recognize it as that, of course, in order to make money. Okay? They had a exchange rate from out of country people that had to exchange. They were selling damaged goods, lambs with blemishes, second rate goods, so that these and these guy people were pilgrims. You, know, you have to understand that they were probably well over a million pilgrims that had flooded into the greater Jerusalem area for that eight day feast. And these people had to buy food along the way, perhaps buy lodging if they didn't sleep out in the open. Most of them did not bring a lamb or a turtle dove or anything else with them. They had to purchase them. They went to the people they could trust, the religious leaders of the nation, and got bilked. That's a polite word for it, okay? Uh, on the exchange rate and the quality of goods and everything else, you know, God was upset, okay? God in the flesh was upset. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said, it is written, Old Testament prophecy. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, okay? Okay? He goes on and says, the blind and the lame came to him. He healed them. Chief priests and scribes saw everything that was going on. Okay? And the, all the children of Israel crying, Hosanna to the son of David. And they were overjoyed because he was doing so much good. And he was helping things get done the way they were supposed to, to honor God. And they said, we better kill him. That's essentially where their intensity of their persecution of Christ begins to ramp up and really go for it. They were displeased, it tells us. Many of them said, what is going on? What is being said? What are, is, and Jesus' response, have you never read? He's quoting Old Testament scripture, prophetic again. He's using it prophetically Okay. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, they have perfected the praise. Okay. Again, a picture of prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling. He is quoting it. He is acting it out. He is pursuing it. You know, uh, he's, everything from finding donkeys to the worship that needed to be accomplished in the temple that goes with it. Well, the second thing is found a little shorter, but beginning in verse 17, he says, he left them and left the city and went to Bethany. Bethany was about four miles kind of southwest. And he lodged there, uh, amongst other places. This is where Lazarus and, and Mary and Martha were. Okay, that was the brother and two sisters that you hear about so much in scripture. He, now in the morning, as he returned, this is the, this is the next morning, okay? he returned to the city, he was hungry, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, found nothing on it, but leaves only, and said to it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. This doesn't make a lot of sense to you and I, because we look at it, we do all our harvesting in like, what, September, October, you know, we go, before you go pluck potatoes off the trees, and and, you know, dig up the peaches out of the ground, you know, under the potato bushes and stuff. Yeah, you get the drill. It, uh, you know, that's, we were thinking fall harvest. No, yeah, Israel has some different fruits available, some different agriculture. They harvest some of their crops in the spring and then some in the fall. It depends upon the early and the latter rains and all kinds of things that we don't deal with from that agricultural perspective. The fig tree should have been producing figs at that time of the year. You want to know why it wasn't? Because it was going to be an example of Christ's power over creation. Okay, The Messiah who'd ridden into town on a donkey the day before was now going to reinforce specifically to his apostles that he was the creator God. Everything that goes with it. This fig tree thing then goes on. 
uh, and he curses in effect. Uh, they let no fruit grow on you from now forward forever, and the fig tree presently withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they were astonished and said, look how soon the whole tree withered away. Okay. Now, what you don't get here is you go to Mark uh, chapter 11, I think it is, you find that this was the next day. The next day, on Tuesday, this was happened on Monday, on Tuesday, they come back out and now the, we've, he's going out. One, one day he curses the fig tree and the next day as they pass by, it's all withered and completely dried up. That's the picture. Okay. Uh, so don't, if you read different gospel accounts, you have to kind of harmonize them and put them together to get the chronology quite right. Okay. Uh, verse 21, Jesus answered or responded to them and said, truly I say to you, if you have faith, Without doubting, you can not only do this to a fig tree, but you can say to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and there goes the mountain. All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. Now, before you start getting carried away with this, and a lot of groups in Christianity over the centuries have, you know, this is not a name it and claim it endorsement. You know? It doesn't work that way, you know. Is do you believe, Jesus said. You have to believe. There has to be faith. What is that faith? Faith is in God's character, God's power, God's will, and God's direction. If it's God's will that that mountain be moved and you align yourself with God's will, that faith is so operative and so powerful that that mountain is going to head for the Pacific Ocean. But if you, you can believe it all you want in yourself, okay, but that's not biblical faith unless it's aligned with the will of God. You can believe just as hard as you can possibly believe, and if it's not in God's will, that mountain's not going to budge, and the fig tree is not going to wither. You have to, as a believer, you have to be aligned with God's will. Otherwise, it's not a biblical faith, and it's not a biblical program. Sorry, it doesn't work. People go into hospital rooms where somebody is dying, you know, and with all sincerity, exercise all the personal faith they can, you know, to cause that person to be restored to help the person dies anyway. And now you've got one or two conclusions, don't you? Either God couldn't do it, or God's an old meanie, or I lacked enough faith, and it's my, my fault, my problem, and now you've got a giant guilt complex. Satan just won, didn't he? Because now your faith is so hindered, you're not sure whether you should pray or if prayer is effective or anything about prayer, you know, or is God listening or maybe God's an old meanie or what? It's none of the above. Okay? A biblically valid faith is always in the will of God. What did Jesus say over and over and over? Not my will, but thy will be done. You have to pray believing. First John, go back and don't go over there for the sake of time. But in chapter 5, if you ask anything in the Father's will, it shall be accomplished. Go back and read chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And you'll see that how true that is. Okay? That's what Jesus is getting across. What is Jesus projecting? Okay? Not only this, this little dialogue about where faith fits in, but look at his power over creation. He said, this is what the second person of the Godhead can accomplish. He is God. He has power. He has control over the trees. And by implication, the mountains and where they fit. He wants to blow them up. He can blow them up. He wants to level them. He can level them. He wants to toss them into the Pacific. That's his business too. They're his mountains. It's his ocean. If it's his will, and we are attuned to that will, then we can experience the joy of being dead square in the middle of God's will. What a fantastic thing it really is. 
Then you have the third thing in the next few verses. You have the undeniable authority of who God is, beginning in verse 23. When he came again to the temple, the chief priests and the elders came unto him and said, well, what, who gives you the authority to do these things? I mean, he's writing in and fulfillment of prophecy. He's doing the donkey thing, the palm thing, being recognized by the people as the Messiah. And now he's doing his miraculous works over creation, you know, with the fig tree, because this word is getting around. And the chief priest says, who gives you the right to do this? Where do you get the power to do this? Who do you think you are? Well, he answers them, okay? He says in verse 24, I will ask you one thing, and if you answer my question, I'll tell you where my authority comes from. Kind of an interesting response. We don't have time to go into it. But the question is, John the Baptist, when he baptized, where did the authority come from? Was it men or was it heavenly? You know, where, how did that all work? He said that baptism thing that John the Baptist did. And, well, they immediately went to committee meeting, send out for coffee, donuts, pull up the chairs, you know, we'll get somebody in to record the whole thing, and we'll set an agenda, and maybe sometime in the next month or two, if we meet regularly, we'll actually come up with the idea of what we're supposed to be talking about. That's Roger's view of committee meetings. Okay? They reason with themselves, saying, you know, if we say from heaven, this Jesus guy is going to say, well, why don't you believe God then if it comes from heaven? If that's where the authority for John's baptism comes from. But if you say of men, if that's going to be our response, well, everybody thinks John the, the Baptist was sent from God. And if we say of men, we're going to have a rebellion on our hands. They're going to storm the, the, the temple. You know, I mean, rocket-propelled grenades, claymore mines, you know, tanks, flamethrowers. I mean, we're in trouble. We can't do this. So they said, we had better be ready for it. We'd better be politically discreet and say, and this is what they did, we can't tell. And Jesus says, well, I'm not going to tell you either. <laughs> now, kind of an interesting response. Now, what he does, however is he goes on and he does tell them in what's going on next. But that's the secular challenge right there. Okay. People attack the authority of Christ when he states who he is. Okay. Okay. That's the challenge and the response. But verse 28 and following says, Jesus goes on and now the rest of the chapter, he does bring some, some thinking here. Okay. What do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, go work in the vineyard, and said, nope, not me. Not, no, I don't do that kind of stuff, blue-collar work. But afterwards, he got to thinking about it and thought, well, you know, I mean, Dad wants me to. I better go. So he went anyway. He came, the dad comes to the second son and says the same thing, and he said, you bet, I'm going, Pop. Let's let me, I'll grab my shoes, but he didn't. In other words, he was just telling Pop, the old man, what he wanted to hear. And then, you know, he went bowling, I guess. I don't know. Uh, which one of them, Jesus asked, did the will of the Father? And they said, well, the first one did, obviously. Yeah, the first one did. Yeah. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, that publicans and harlots will get to the kingdom of God before you will. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta, you got to love this. I mean, you know, Jesus was not particularly concerned about winning friends and influencing people when it comes to you know, people that were in objection to who he was. He said, John came to you in the way of righteousness. You didn't believe him. The publicans and the harlots, however, did believe him. When you had seen, you didn't repent. You saw the palm branches. You saw the miracles. You saw the fig tree. You saw this stuff. Okay? But you said, no, uh -uh. But the publicans and the harlots saw it and said, yeah, that's God. They believed it. But you didn't. Now, he's not really telling a story about this make-believe parable, is he? 
is there's a difference between talking and walking, right? It's easy to talk about Christianity. It's easy to talk about God. It's easy to mouth all the right words and, and you know, say the right prayers and all the other stuff. But, you know, it, uh, you know, if we just walk away from Christianity at 12 o'clock on Sunday mornings and do our own thing for the next six days, which one, of, which, are we doing the will of God? James, in chapter 2, starting in verse 14 through the rest of the chapter, talks about works and faith, you know. James never says that you're saved because of how hard you try. He said, you will try if you are saved. Okay. He said, I'll, you say you have faith. I'll show you my faith by my works. He never said he was saved because he worked, but he said, because I am saved, I will. What? Demonstrate righteousness. Right doing. Right thinking. Right decisions and right actions. One last one as we close up here, okay? The last part portion of it, it uh, verse 33. Here's another parable. Okay? It, uh, this is fairly well known, so I'm not going to bore you with all the details. Okay? There was a certain householder, planted a vineyard, dug the wine press, built a tower, let it out to husband, and went on a far country. Okay? He probably had a retirement condo in Hawaii, you know, and he went over there. And when the time of the fruit harvest drew near, he sent servants uh, to the guys who he'd rented out the vineyard to because he wanted, he was a, apparently a sharecropper. I mean, a type of those, you know, divisional labor type of thing. You know, I'll, you know, I own it. I've done all the money. I put all the improvements into the property. You guys are just going to come in and run it. And when you harvest, you get half, I get half. Right? Something like that. But the servants, or, or the, the husbandmen, they figured, man, this guy's living in Hawaii. He doesn't even know what's going on. He's probably too old and too feeble to ever come back over here and check anyway. It, uh, we'll just uh, uh, run these guys off. So they beat one up. They kill one. They stone a third one. He sent other servants, and they do the same thing. You know, they, the, but finally, he sends his son and said, well, you know, maybe the problem is they don't really identify that I own the property, I'll send my son, and they will recognize him and how serious this is, and they will give him the, my, fit, my half of the, of the grape crop. Okay? But the, see, this is the difference. Good people think one way. Evil people do not think the way good people think. Ask any cop. Right, Brian? Yeah. You know, bad people don't think that way. Okay? Evil begets evil. They don't automatically somehow come up with a good idea. The husbandmen, because they were unrighteous and evil, said, we can solve this whole thing once for all. We'll just kill the kid. Now, we're talking about a son. We're not talking about somebody 12 years old. We're talking about somebody probably 35 or 40. Okay? Grown man. And so they catch him, kill him, and they slay him. Now, Jesus asked the question. Remember, he's talking to the Pharisees. In verse 40, when the Lord of the vineyard comes, what do you think he's going to do to the husbandman? Hmm? Well, automatic response. There is, he will miserably, now I get it, miserably destroy. It's not just, you know, whack him in the head with a stick. It's not just kill them off. Miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will then let out his vineyard to other husbandmen that will render him fruits in due season. Okay. Now Jesus said to him, you're back to fulfilling Old Testament quoting scripture. Have you ever read in the scripture that the stone the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing. Why is it marvelous? If the Lord is doing it, why are we astonished at it? That's the meaning of it. So therefore, in conclusion, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you, given to a people, it's ethnos, the word we use for people, not nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whoever will fall on this stone, he's talking about himself, isn't he? He's talking about himself. He's talking about God's putting together okay, this orchestrating 
this whole Palm Sunday situation that he knows is going to take him to the cross and is going to re result in death, burial, and resurrection and the required faith in that substitutionary death for sin. Otherwise, they're going to wind up broken on the very stone that could have saved them. That's kind of an interesting picture. Same stone. But how do men respond to it? Well, Jesus says, these guys, evil men, because of their rejection, non-righteousness, because of lack of faith, are going to wind up being crushed. I don't know, you can say miserably destroyed. Don't think too lightly of that term. Go look up a really accurate description of eternal hellfire where the flame is never quenched and the worm never dies and it's totally dark all the time, uh, that's miserable destruction. You and I usually think of destruction as poof, blown out of existence. Yeah. Now, destroy means to be rendered inoperable. Yeah. Uh, that's the Greek word. That's what it comes across. Yeah. So he's, he's going to miserably... These people are sending themselves to hell because of their lack of faith in what God has provided, the chief stone of the corner. You get the idea. This in really, when you look at this, these men condemn themselves, don't they? Jesus gives them a parable, and they say, kill them all, those wicked guys, you know, take that, you know. And Jesus said, well, yeah, you do realize you're talking about yourselves, don't you? And, well, at that point, yeah, they do. And finally, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he spoke of them. Ah, the self-condemnation of religion. You know what's going to happen, folks? <coughs> when men stand in front of the God of Christianity and he asks them, what did, have you ever done to convince me that I should allow you into heaven for eternity? And they're going to say, we were religious. We took a pilgrimage. We made vows. You know, we sacrificed during Lent. You know, we crawled to Mecca on our knees. We worshiped the prayer wheel. Whatever it happens to be, uh, that's not the entrance requirement. The entrance requirement is the chief cornerstone, isn't it? Not religion. Quite a bit of difference. So the danger of rejecting the king, because the kingdom can be taken from you. That which is from the idea of at least not without getting into too deep a theology, People have an opportunity to step into the kingdom of God. If they reject that because they reject the chief cornerstone, that kingdom offer is no longer there. It's taken off the plate. Men choose darkness rather than light. Jesus told Nicodemus that's the condemnation. That's what condemns people. God doesn't condemn anybody. Men condemn themselves when they reject the chief cornerstone. So, you got to love the donkey, right? Yeah. That whole donkey thing that we started back in the first part of the chapter, that's pretty cool. It really is. I mean, wow. Transportation. Already had gas in the tank, you know? And the owner was said, yeah, sure, take him, use him, you know? I, I want to meet up to that guy someday. I hope he winds up in heaven. I want to ask him, how did you figure all that out? What made you say when those guys saw about them? Hey, you know, can you imagine your wife coming? You know, and saying, hey, Ralph, there's a couple of guys out there stealing the horses. You know, and, uh, and I know what some of you would do. <laughs> you know, get away from my wife. No, and this guy sticks out and says, ah, what's going on? He says, well, the master has need of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, wow. You know, you got to meet that guy. There's much, so much more than the donkey, isn't it? There's a lot more there. 
That's all part of Palm Sunday. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us this brief time to open up a Sunday that occurred more than 2,000 years ago in a land far away that impacts all of mankind for all of eternity. And we do thank you for that donkey. We thank you for that fig tree. We thank you for Christ running out the money changers. We thank you, Lord, for the parables that were told and the truth that we can glean from them because all of this makes our understanding of your love for us so rich. And we praise you this day in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.